So the talk I want to give today, yeah, it's about local topological order and boundary algebras. I'm going to start with a big picture type thing, and I'm borrowing this uh, slide here from Colleen. Um, she uh, gave this amazing talk at, at AIM, like uh, maybe it was over a year ago in, in this workshop we did on higher categories and topological order. So uh, kind of borrowing one of her slides here. So up here, I'm going to put unitary fusion categories. And starting with the unitary fusion category, we can build from this a two plus one dimensional topological order by this Levin one string net model. Um, and so this is uh, the, you know, TQC is the topic of today. So this topological order thing is what we're going to try to study. There she is. Okay, so sorry, I'm borrowing your slide. So I, I, <laughs> hey, hey Dave, that pillar kind of walks, so you don't go too far to the right. I'm just going to do it. It's just right here. The square is that okay? You can see that not not really. I'm at the right. Okay, I won't go any further to the right. Okay. Um, and so, you know, if you ask a, a physicist what 2 plus 1d topological order means, uh, you might hear a lot of different answers. You might hear that the low energy effective field theory is a, T, is a, a TQFT. So here, low energy effective theory gives you this 2 plus 1d TQFT. And now, Starting with the UFC, we can get a 2 plus 1D TQFT here. And that's uh, either, there's lots of different people who have worked on this. Tarai Biro, Akbianu, Evans Kuragashi, Barrett Westbury. Lots of people have, have done uh, this kind of thing. And, you know, this is one way that you might say, well, from some top watch order, you might try to get some categorical data back. Okay. So then I'll, I'll recreate it here. Thank you. UFC, <laughs> two plus one DT, two of T for posterity, really. Uh, Brad Biro, Akbianu, Evans Kwagashi, Eric Wetsbury, not in any particular order. Over here, we have two plus one D topological order. This was Levin Wynn string net. one was a wavy arrow that says low energy effective field theory. Okay. And then they also might say that the low energy excitations form the unitary modular fusion category, not tensor category. I'll, I'll follow Colleen's lead here. So this is the Anionic excitations. Right, it gives you one of those. And well, we have another construction that starts with the unitary fusion category. It gives you one of these called the Drinfeld center. And so uh, these white arrows are constructions. These are things where you input a unitary fusion category and you get out one of these other pieces of data. It's a, it's a rigorous construction. And um, these orange arrows are meant to signify physics in some way. Um, they're, they're perhaps a little less rigorous, but you know it when you see it, right? That's kind of the idea here. And so what I'm going to talk about today is, um, well, the ones that are in the image of unitary fusion categories are, are kind of special. And what, they're what we call local topological order. Local topological order, where you can look at things locally and, and access these ground states locally and get lots of information. And in the case of local topological order, which we're going to axiomatize, we're going to build a rigorous arrow that way such that this commutes. That's the goal of today's talk. Cool. That's the big picture. Is that little writing, the arrow up, this curly arrow up, diagrammatic extensions? Like Anionic excitations. Yeah. Okay. So that's the big picture of what we want to do today. And so I'm going to get a build a little bit on, on Corey's talk here, but let me tell you our goals here. So the, the, the bottom right-hand corner is the physics. Yes. And so what does local mean in the physics setting? I'm going to define that precisely. That's exactly what I'm going to I'm going to give you a precise step. So what are our goals today? Well, and I'm going to define 
slash axiomatize local topological order. So this is LTO. And this is going to build on the TQO axioms of Bravi, Hastings, and Polakis. I kind of guessed you were going to do that, but those are maths words. So the, the, the question of what does the phenomenology of local... What's the... Oh, like, why don't... Yeah, so I, I'm going to tell you... I'm going to show you how it's different. Well, what... Yeah. Well, just let me get to it, okay? It'll be the first thing we do after I, I reproduce Corey's, you know, nets of algebras and things like that. It'll be the first thing we do. Okay. And the second thing is we're going to show that the known models that we love, the sort of code, Kataya quantum double model, the levin wen string net model, these satisfy these axioms. Okay, so these are these axioms are, are developed with concrete examples in mind. Okay. So we're going to do that. Three, we're going to use these, use the LTO axioms. build a boundary net and that's going to give a description of these anionic excitations in a rigorous way okay so we're going to be able to recover what the anionic the, the brain infusion category because you know we have it we don't know exactly when this thing gives you a modular thing starting from here but in our cases they will be modular because they're they're the ones you you think about and finally where you have a state-based approach to boundaries. Okay, so basically states on this boundary net are gonna be boundaries of the theory. Okay. That's gonna give us a, the state-based approach. So, and there we can actually, again, we can study the known boundaries of say Torah code rough and smooth via our, our model. And then we can, we can yeah. and. I'll get to that, that theorem later. So this is our main, uh, that's the main idea for today. Questions before I start? Is this going to be restricted to topological orders that arise as a Drinfeld center? I mean, in the sense that in, if you have some topological order that is not a Drinfeld center, it does so not apply. Today's talk will specialize in this case, but our methods should apply to ones that are, say, chiral. But I'll, I'll point out where you might have to do something a little different yeah, that's to happen. But for today's setup, it will just be lo this local topological order, and, and this is going to commute. That's the the theorem for today. Yeah. Good. Hide the board immediately. Make it reappear. Math magician. All right, here we go. So uh, let's start with uh, quantum spin systems. So that's spell. So Corey talked a lot about these. Uh, uh, by the way, now everything is going to be in parallel. So I'm going to give you some definitions, and I'm going to give you example in parallel. The next three boards. That's the idea. Okay. So first of all, quantum spin system. Um, for us, we're actually thinking about there's some lattice. I'll draw this. And for for simplicity, we think about this as either being a vertex lattice or the edge lattice. Okay, it can be either one. It can be actually way more general. In our paper, we do vertex lattice, and then oh, I should also state at some point that this is joint work with. Let me bring that back up. Right there at the bottom here, where it can be easily not seen. So this is a. Uh, Joint with, and now I have to get everybody in the right order. Corey Jones, Peter Nikens, two A's, and then Daniel Wallach, who is a PhD student of mine. And this appears as 2307.12552. Okay. So it's on the archive. And then there's a second paper that talks about um, the Katai quantum double models. And there we use the edge lattice, but in that paper, we just do the vertex lattice. So, um, great, fantastic. So here, what's going on is to every vertex, I'll, I'll start talking about vertices, but my example is gonna be Torah code. And there it's gonna be an edge lattice, but it's it's kind of easy to go back and forth. It's, it's not a problem. Edge lattice, do you mean that the degrees of freedom? The degrees of freedom will be on the edges instead of the vertices. But here I'm gonna draw my pictures with them being on the vertices because it's a little easier to draw the pictures, okay? 
but you can do either. It doesn't matter. Or you could do something more general. It's just easier if you do. Yeah, anyway. So to each one of these, we'll put a Qdit on everything here. And for our Tor code, right here, we'll put a copy of C2, right? As you know. And then um, to each rectangle. So a rectangle is something that looks like this. In this case, it's very easy to write the rectangles because you just have to know which vertices are inside and which ones are out, okay? So to every rectangle, so the rectangle I'm gonna call lambda, we get this thing called A of lambda, that's the local algebra. In this case, it's just the tensor product over the sites in lambda of MD of C. Now in Corey's talk, he said, oh, A of lambda is just some local algebra and you can make it different than the big tensor product here. And you can, you can do that. For, for the talk today, I'm just gonna simplify and just do the, the quantum spin system, all right? So Corey gave you these other axioms for just an arbitrary net of algebras. And we're gonna need those later when we talk about boundary nets, but let's just keep it easy, okay? So what do you do here? Here, it's a little more complicated because when you draw your rectangle, you have to know now which vertices are inside and which ones are not. So you actually, it's just, it's as you can see, it's just a little harder to specify what's inside and what's outside. But again, it's the same thing. It's a big tensor product over the sites inside. Okay, great. And then, you know, when you're doing physics, a lot of times you'll, you'll say, okay, there's, there's maybe Hamiltonian based approach, there's state based approach. And um, we kind of do neither. Well, it, it's, it, that's actually a little bit lying. But what we really start with is what's called a net of projections. So what's a net of projections? Well, for every lambda, I have an operator P lambda in this local algebra A lambda. P lambda is an orthogonal projector. And it should be a net in the sense that if lambda is contained in delta, then the projection P delta is less than or equal to the projection P lambda. So this is ordering of projections. I don't know how familiar that is with everybody. It just means that um, this is the condition that P delta times P lambda is P delta. So saying P delta is a sub projection of P lambda. It says the image, that if I take the, the image of this projection, it's contained in the image of this projection. That's all it means, okay? So in your mind, if you're a physicist, you should think the muting projector, local Hamiltonian, which is frustration free, and then think you're taking the local ground state space on that rectangle. And that's this notion of local that we were just talking about. Yeah. Okay. So up here, how do you go about doing this? Well, um, we all know that we've got these nice plaquette operators and, and vertex and star operators, we call them. So here, if I call this a star, we call this usually a star. This is the, the term AS, which is the tensor product over the edges L in the star of, and I like to do Z here on these edges. Okay. Why isn't PA inside P lambda? Why is P lambda inside PA? P lambda is an operator and it's in this algebra. So this is just a, this is just a tensor product of matrices. So I'm just saying there's some projection in this algebra. Okay, the image being anyway. The image of this is some is in it, this thing acts on a tensor product Hilbert space, so its image lies in some tensor product of local Hilbert spaces. This is just saying this in the image of this is a subspace of the image of that. Um, doesn't have more qubits in it, the delta, because lambda is inside delta. It does, but that's the whole idea of a net of projections. I'm just assigning to every rectangle some projection. But the condition is that the image of this has to be contained in this. So just think it's not the identity. It's not the, it's not the identity. Whatever projection. No, it's not, it's not, it's not just the whole space here. It's a it's it's a carefully crafted projection. Mm -hmm. This is a special one. Yeah. So so think think commuting projector local Hamiltonian. I'm I'm giving you an I'll give you an example right here. So just then why does this thing have to be rectangle? It like doesn't a, have to be. Yeah. Just you want it to be like simply connected and contractible and you know, mm -hmm. nice. Some, some contractible bounded patch is really the idea. Mm -hmm. okay. Just a follow, follow up a question. Your P uh, delta, P delta is uh, algebra in A of delta, right? That's A of delta, that's right. And, and 
And if you include A of lambda into A of delta by putting identities everywhere, yeah, it's just, it's a subalgebra. So you have to really use this definition for the spin system for the, take the, you use the tensor product of Hilbert space. Yes, but you know, as Corey said, there's an abstract definition where just, it, you just have a net of algebras where if you have a, an inclusion lambda to delta, there's an inclusion of algebras. So you can, do it. So you can abstractify all this. I'm just trying to keep it basic. Keep it really better. So we've got these star operators. I have these plaquette operators here. Sure, the X's. Okay, and what's the projection then? In this case, the lambda is, let's get it right. So it's I plus AS on two, and you take the product over S contained in lambda, and then you take the product of I plus BP on two, which, uh, Again, the this containing lambda. Okay. So what are the Zs and the Xs? Those are the poly matrices. So Z Z L Z is this, X is that, they act on C2. Z L means it's a Z acting on link L. Yeah. And and also I and I suppress tensor the uh, tensor I everywhere else. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's fine. So here, this is the projection onto the local ground state space. Okay, it's the local terms that we all know that this is this is commuting projector, frustration free, and so this is our our projection onto the local ground state space. And so now you see that if lambda is contained in delta, well, delta has more terms, and so it gives you a sub projection. Yes. This is a jargon. What do you mean, frustration free? Frustration free is that the ground state of the the ground state is also a ground state of all the local terms. In the Hamiltonian. Okay. So your lattice is at least planar embedded. Yeah, it's it's a Z two lattice. I'm always working on say Z two either, and I take either the vertices or the edges. I'm just to, just in the plane. Yeah, everything here is about it's about this you know just Z two topology. Well, I could have that thing and forget the natural planar embedding. But... Yeah, I mean the lat. Yeah, so we're going to use the lattice. We're going to use this geometry later. Yeah, I think at some point you were talking about where does the geometry come in? And that's when we start taking this cut in the boundary. That's where it's one of the things. That's yeah. when it's going to come in. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So now I can tell you what the topological quanta, the, the LTO axioms are. The first one is, uh, so we're, we call it, uh, so what are our axioms? So we have LTO1. And really this is uh, based on... Put this here. This is for examples. This is based on the TQO conditions. Froggy, Hastings, Blockus. Okay, and this is, I think, in uh, ten. So um, it, it's based on this, and we can show that the R one condition implies both of their conditions. But it's basically looking at their condition. And you just look at it hard enough and you say, okay, clearly this is the first condition. Okay. So what does this say? So how does this work? Well, I start with some rectangle lambda. And then I look at a, rectang a rectangle delta, which is bigger, which contains it. And we're going to say lambda is completely surrounded by, delta surrounds lambda by S completely. This is completely surrounded by S. So S is a parameter. Here, it means we have at least, this number is at least S. We have at least S dots here, at least S dots here, et cetera. So you really need this space S on every side. So delta surrounds lambda by S. That's what this means, okay? So anytime you have this, it means if I cut down my lambda operators by delta, I get the scalars times P delta. That's axiom one. Saying what this is essentially saying is that the image of P delta is a quantum error correction code. And I'll say why that what why that is in a in a in, a, in just a minute. So what Pravi, Hastings, and Michalakis did was they said instead of looking at the local oper the P delta, they looked at the ground the the projection onto the ground state globally. But they're working on a finite lattice. 
And then they had another condition about that that had to do with stability, where they were looking at uh you know these local these reduced densities. But if you're if you're on a nice you know thing, we can show that this actually implies both of their axioms. Okay. But it's essentially their axiom. Why is it a, queer, a quantum error correction code? It says it's a quantum error correction code with errors from A of lambda. This is saying, okay, well, if I only allow, if I have errors here, I can correct for them by projecting with a big P delta. Well, why is that? So if I have my operator X lambda is my error, and I have some state psi, right? So I've created some error here. Well, how do I map back? I just hit it with P delta. And the point is that psi here, since it's in the image of P delta, I can pull a P delta out for free. And so P delta X lambda P delta, that's just a scalar times lambda. I'm oh, sorry, it's a scalar lambda times psi again. Yeah. So if I have a state psi, I really only care about it up to phase, right? So either I've killed it completely, but well, that's fine. You can kill it, right? It means you've got to like reinitialize your quantum system and do, you know, computation again, or I recover my state up to phase, but that's fine, right? Because states are only up to phase, yeah? Lambda Maybe you, go ahead. Lambda depends on X. Yeah, lambda depends on X, yeah, that's right. But that it doesn't, that's fine, that's good, that's great. Or you're saying A are the correctable errors. Yeah, A of lambda are the correctable errors, that's right. So when you do a quantum error correction code, you specify where the errors are, you know, you know, yeah. Well, but there's also non-correctable errors. Of course. Of course. Those aren't in A. Those aren't in A of lambda, but yeah, so, but, of course. You're saying that there exists an S or you specify it? This is any, so this S is a, S is a global constant. So <clears throat> this is a global constant of the system, of the, of the net of projections. So what I say is, okay, what is a lo local topological order means LTO1, there exists S greater than zero such that that's global. So maybe I say exist S greater than zero globally such that anytime I have this, I get that. The other day, Corey said that he doesn't, the S is pretty small. Or yeah, that, so let's do Tor code. <laughs> But if lambda goes really close to the boundary of delta, like that shouldn't be correctable. Like, I mean, in your scheme, there shouldn't be, there's no definition locally correctable, you know, because like, let's say the distance is uh, colder. So if like the string is shorter than some length, they should be correctable. But if you move it closer to delta, then there's S gets really small. Yeah, yeah. If, if again, you need at least S here, as long as you have at least S, I can correct for stuff in lambda. That's the point. Yeah. Okay. Good question. So, yeah. You don't really need this the theory to be a Drinfeld center to have right. this kind of a that's right. All of our axioms work in generality. I'm just saying the examples today are all going to be Drinfeld centers. The the whole point is that whenever you're working with a quantum spin system, then you would expect to only get Drinfeld centers out of our machine. But if I worked with oh, say some other kind of net of algebras, maybe infinite dimensional net of algebras, you should be able to come up with chiral models from this way. Yeah, just just keep it easy. I'm keeping spin systems here, and then we're and we're trying to prove this here. But this spin systems system. can realize the chiral, the non drinkable centers. Maybe not in your. No, we wait, they, 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 I don't. I well, we, yeah. Let, maybe that's a good topic for afterward. But um, we expect that the the axioms that we have here, if you're working with a spin system, should only recover drinkable centers. How do you put to the case where you have a like an air chain that's close to the boundary? That's the next axiom. So core code. Again, it's tough because now we're working with an edge lattice, so I have to, you know, put everything quite carefully. Always need to put all the dots in. Place where slides would actually help a great deal. What does S look like in this case? In this case, S is two. So you want to make sure that there's really enough distance here. Let's see. Let's, let me make sure I get it right here. S should be two. Uh, next one here. Here, S is two. Okay. 
And in fact, this might be a little bit small. Here I only have a plaquette, but that's okay. Okay, so S is, S is two in Tor code. So there's this global constant, which is two. And then how does this work here? So am I already here at the, yep, there we go. So how does it work? We got to prove this axiom for Tor code. And here are our steps to prove it. One, every X in A of lambda is a linear combination of polymonomials, just like from Arthur's talk. Right? I have a poly basis for A of lambda. I just write things in polymonomials. So it suffices to prove it when X is a, is a polymonomial. Okay. That's okay. Yeah. Okay. Two. Every polynomial either commutes or anti commutes. each AS or BP, because the AS and BPs are polymonomials, and polymonomials either commute or anti-commute. Three. Say X is a polymonomial and it anti-commutes. So X AS is minus AS X. Okay. If this is true. If the two S is in play, it's different, of course. They are same S in play. So the S equals two. Uh, oh, no, different S's, yeah. So the S is a star here. S is a constant up there. Yes, you're absolutely right. Um, this S is also different. <laughs> <laughs> um, can't help it. Okay. Uh, if this is true, then just cut down by P delta. And what happens? So if I put a P delta here, and a P delta here, and then a P delta here, and a P delta here, well, P delta absorbs AS because I plus AS over two absorbs AS and everything here commutes, right? So P delta absorbs AS. That tells us that P delta X P delta is minus P delta X P delta is zero. So it wins, right? If I, and so, and then four, you just prove if X commutes with every AS and BP, then X is a product of the AS and BP plus the scalar. The four is this algorithm here. This is uh, originally, you know, this was proven in 07 by, let me say some names here, um, Maliki, Thanis, and Horodeki in 07. Um, but there, and so there, we, we credit them with this proof of, of that, of LTO1 here for, for code. And so this is an interesting little algorithm. It's a nice little brain teaser and you can do it if you, if at some point I lose you, just try to prove this. It's a, it's a lovely little thing. It's a nice little algorithm. I, I, I would never want to deprive you of the, of the chance to solve it. It's not so bad. Um, so that's it. That does it. Okay. LTO1, check. Do you have a nice cuted example? A nice cuted example? Yeah, sure. You can do Z mod N tor code. Z mod D tor, sorry, Z mod D tor code. Um, you can do uh, the, the type quantum double model. Those are one models. Eleven one models. Yeah. You can do all of them. There are models that aren't exactly solvable like those that, that we know how to do. Not you know, not yet. <laughs> but we want to. We want I to think it's true. So I think it's true for for the I mean for as for like type honeycomb model that is definitely a good one to try um, and there I want to see what happens we haven't tried yet I had some I had some undergrads look at say the the Xcode in 3D because this is again I, I'm doing two dimensions today but as Corey said you can do this in any dimension but you're only going to get point like excitations from it so you wouldn't expect to get the whole physics story from it so I just want to say in two dimensions where you are going to get the whole physics story from it. Um, so I think they looked at Ha code over the summer, but then they had really good progress with Kataya quantum double 
And so when I talk about Katai Quantum Double, that's joint work with some undergraduate researchers from this past summer. And it's, it's yeah. It's almost there. Sorry? Almost there, you think? Well, the Katai Quantum Double is done. We've oh, done. Okay, no, but Katai Honeycomb. Uh, Katai Honeycomb, we don't, we, we want to try it, but we haven't, we haven't yet really delved into it yet. Yeah. But that's certainly on our list of things to do. Okay. So, so quantum double, you can't use this poly trick, is that right? You have to do more work. For quantum double, you can't use this poly trick, but you, you do a little more work, right? So you use the, you do use uh, either the clock or shift. I can't remember. Use one of them, but then you use the the projections onto the, like, you, you do left translations. So that's like your, your shift matrix, but then you use projections. And you can do another type of, of algorithm that works. Yeah. And so that's in the, that's in that paper. It's really based on this algorithm that uh, Peter Nikens did in his thesis. The four is still supposed to hold for Torah code, or Sorry? is the number four supposed to hold for Torah code? Yes, for yeah, that holds for Torah code. Yeah. Like I guess, like if you have the string operators across, how is that like the decomposition into the A and B's? I like, guess a product of A and B. You're supported on lambda. Um. So you have to be supported on lambda, and then you commute with every A S or B P. If you're a string operator. Yeah, then by def you're gonna then you have endpoints and those endpoints are detectable by AS or BPs, right? They're excitations, which means that 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 being an excitation means that there is a term in the in the Hamiltonian you don't commute with. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly this condition number three. So there you're just saying, well, if I have no excitations, then I had to be a bunch of closed loops, mm -hmm. and closed loops are products of AS and BPs. That's the the general expression. That's not a proof, but that's the intuition. It's because it's local. I mean, yeah. That's right, because you're supported on lambda, but you're you're compressing by p del. Not, nothing surprising there. Okay. So what's LTO two? So for us, we actually have four LTO axioms, but I'm going to simplify four axioms down into two because the the three and four are really make two work. Okay. So I'm going to give two in a very um, yeah. I'm going to give you the idea of two. And then if you have more questions and force me to get more rigorous, I can, but I, I don't think, I, I think the idea is quite clear. So now, so again, I have Lambda and this time Delta is large, but it's allowed to overlap on one side. And I have S dots again, at least S on the three sides, which don't overlap. <laughs> So again, there exists this the same S, and since we have LTO one and LTO two, you can assume the same S for both. Just take the max of the ones that would work, right? So it's fine. So again, I have this S greater than zero globally, such that okay. This time, we write lambda del delta surrounds lambda. The other one, if I do less than less than, that's completely surrounds. This one is just some notation for it. Okay. So anytime I have this. It implies something. It implies that if I cut down A of lambda by P delta, so here we said this was an error correction code. As Corey is saying, well, I can't correct for all the errors in lambda anymore. And if you think about what's happening in a step four algorithm, you're able to start pushing things into the boundary. So what happens is that your errors are going to collect on the boundary. So what happens? I have some algebra that's called this B of I, but I can write this as B of I P delta here. B of I is a finite dimensional C star algebra. So what a C star algebra, but you know, now I'm using operator algebra terms, but whatever. It's a finite dimensional star subalgebra that's supported on sites near this I, which I've defined to be the boundary of delta intersect the boundary of lambda. So this here is I. And this boundary algebra is supposed to be supported on sites near I inside lambda and delta. So you should think, okay, it, it extends slightly into the bulk here, but not very far. And it's really independent of, lambda, of the, the choices of lambda and delta That, that do this as long as they're big enough. Really, as long as lambda, yeah, as lambda is big enough. 
the lambda has to be big enough to include all those sites near I. Once lambda is big enough, and delta surrounds lambda by enough region, then there's this algebra B of I, which we can define. It's literally the compression of A of lambda by P delta is stuff supported near the boundary times P delta. So you can, you can just look at your system and figure out what it's supposed to be. Now, in our paper, we give a nice abstract definition of what B of I is, and we, we do it you know very mathematically and very rigorously. But today, I think this is, this is suitable for today's discussion. Okay, it gives you the right idea of what's happening. And I think you'll really see when I do this concrete example for Tor code. Okay, system, you then take the uh, delta to be your impact or something? What do you like to do? I'm sorry, could you could you repeat that one more time? Like, um, if you have like, a, you know, a, a surface code, let's say, yeah. You like to take your delta to be your entire system, the bigger one to be entire system. Yeah, Finite, you, you could do that. And that's what, you know, that's what Bravi, Hastings, McLaughlin do, but you don't have to. And that's yeah. the point of why we call it local topological order. Huh. That's the local that's part, is that you can yes. measure it locally via a local ground patch. Yes. What's the rigorous definition of near I? Of near I. Near, I mean, <laughs> yeah. So, so the rigorous definition means. As long as lambda is big enough, okay. So, so we have. I said we have LTO three and LTO four. There, there's some some constant here that there's like this third condition which says basically if lambda one is contained in lambda two and lambda two is surrounded by S delta, then if I cut this down by if I cut lambda one down by delta, it's the same as cutting lambda two down by delta. Yeah, but but so then that that is what the, near I means. That, that's right. And so what it means is it's the smallest lambda that satisfies that big enough property that you can cut it down to get the boundary algebra. So it's just saying that, yeah. Okay, so then, then, then big enough, it just big, that needs the- Big enough, it, yeah, but, but it's, it, it's totally fine. Let, let me show you what it is. And let me give you an example, a concrete example, and hopefully that, that helps. So Tor code again. So is it sufficient for lambda to be big enough? Sorry to interrupt, but is it sufficient to be big enough like in the direction transverse to the boundary? Or does it have to be big enough like both horizontally and vertically? Uh, right, so so the point is that it has to be big. I mean, the point you know what the boundary here looks like. So it only is big enough in one direction. I mean, it does have, yeah, it only has to be big enough that way. Because you're you're fixing these such that this is I. That's B of I is, de is, the I is determined by picking lambda and delta such that they intersect at I. So is intuition, I'm trying to build correct, uh, if I read this as saying that any violation of these, the error, you know, anything that takes us out of this code space, you can detect by something that's sufficiently local near this boundary. Yes, okay. yes exactly. And, you know, I, I guess so, what I'm asking, if it's sufficient for lam lambda to be a strip, because then it's kind of like saying it's basically a, point like excitation. Yeah, so you can think of these things as like, so I, I just, Xiao Gang just put out this paper a couple of days ago, but apparently he's been thinking about these patch operators on boundaries for a while, which we didn't know about. So what he does is he's thinking about these patch operators, which are like string operators whose excitations lie on the boundary, but that string goes into the bulk. That's what you should be thinking, okay? So essentially that's what these are, right? So if I think about, that, I mean, that's exactly what it's gonna be here. I take, I have other colors. So if I take, this is what the BIs are. Essentially, I have some like excitations here and I have some string that comes out and connects them that way. That would be an operator that is that, that commutes with P delta because the, the only things it doesn't commute with, they lie here on the boundary and those, so, it, so it's fine, yeah? But that, why, that big enough now means I've got to have a little space for that string to creep out into the bulk and then return to the boundary. Does that make sense? Not really. Okay. Um, so Dave, I think it's confusing because you said sites near I, but you didn't, that kind of un emphasizes the exact opposite point that it has to be sufficiently large enough. Yeah. So I think the way you wrote that is a little confusing. Uh, that's fair. Uh, my impression is that you want these endpoints of the string to, to be like supported on a small enough region near the boundary. That's right. I mean, typically they're on the boundary. Let me, let me do Tor code and I think it'll clear up a lot of things. Okay. So... Here we'll do um, something that looks like, uh, okay, let's give enough space here. So here, 
that'll be uh, essentially this this idea here. I mean, I, maybe I can, I'll move this actual a little bit out further. So if I got that'll be our lambda. And delta will be something big because it has to be the, again the s is two for our code. And now if I look at this boundary part here, you'll see that I have this little backwards e part right here, and it doesn't get all of these sites that are in lambda. I just look at sites near the boundary. So this. If I here is these two sites, I call this thing I twiddle, where really these are these five sites, and maybe these two sites here are I. Okay. So this is the stuff that's supported near I, would be two layers here rather than just the single layer on the boundary. Is that related to the S from LTO1? Um, effectively, yes. They're, they're related because it, it all has to do with. The way you define AS and BP. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So effectively, yes. So the, the, the boundary algebra will be supported here. And what are the generators of this boundary algebra? Well, what you should think is that they look like, uh, and here I'm doing a smooth thing, so they should look. The generators look like ASMBP if there were enough room to have them. But there isn't enough room to have them, so we get their generators in here. So what do those look like? Well, they look like operators that look like this. This is Z, 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 and X, like that. Yeah. So these operators here, they commute. So these generators, Commute with every AS and BP term in delta because all these things look like commute. Okay. And therefore they commute with P delta. And then so the idea is just that it's the same idea. Okay. So this implies that these commute with P delta, but they commute with everything there. And then basically a, a modified algorithm. shows that if X is a polymonomial supported in lambda, then if I take P delta X, P delta, this is a product and then also commuting with all the AS and BP in delta. Then if I do this, this is a product of AS, BP, these are in lambda together with these other generators, the, the boundary generators. Boundary generators. And that says if I compress, um, sorry, X is that. I don't have to put the delta in. This X is that. And then that says P delta X P delta is then equal to a product boundary generators times P delta, because these all commute with P delta and these are absorbed by P delta. Okay. So that's how that works. Depends on that. What's the algebra B I now? E of I is going to be the algebra generated by these things. These are my these are my generators. Generator. Okay. Yeah. So if I take this algebra and uh, whatever the algebra generated by that set is P of I. And it's on this region. Are you assuming there's a gapped Hamiltonian somewhere? No, I'm just assuming I have a net of projections on a quantum spin system. Or, I mean, I just on a net of a net of algebras with a net of projections. That's it. So it could be gapless. And the yeah. point is that this, the, these projections, having this net of projections is an incredibly strong axiom. I don't think it implies it's a gapped ground state. Um, so I can show that we can show there is a ground state. There's a unique. Translation variant ground state. Wasn't literally Hastings prove that? Wasn't that the point of no, no, he is he assumed no, he assumed he assumed commuting projector frustration free local Hamiltonian to get TQO. I think that this implies that these are the ground states are 
Hamiltonian. No, if P deltas come from the Hamiltonian, then it's a ground state. But that's what we've proven in our paper. No, but I, I suspect it does. I suspect that, that that's fair. That, that's fair. Um, okay. What does it say in that bracket then? Um, product of the boundary generators. These are my boundary generators. Let's quickly say what that algebra is in this Tor code model. Well, um, in fact, if I look at this, this boundary algebra, I'm going to flip it on its side so it's easier to understand, okay? I had a bunch of things that look like this, and then I have my, my generators that look like here, where I have a, what was it? It was Z, 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 and Xs. Well, the vertical Zs, actually, if you're trying to understand what this algebra is, the vertical Zs go along for the ride. They don't really matter. So I can just change it to something that looks like this, where now I have zi, zi plus one, and xj are my operators, if you want to understand this abstract algebra. So you'll recognize that. Those are the operators from the trans you know, transverse field easing model, right? And so if I look at this algebra, it's quite easy to see that um, b of i Right. If I start thinking about what this is, it's isomorphic to, um, it's actually going to be end in, uh, here, I'll write Hilb Z mod two of the group algebra Z mod two to the tensor N when I have N plus one sites. Then I get this. Right. It's, it's fairly, you know, if you think about this as one plus G, um, where G is the other graded thing, it, there's a there's a nice way that you can do this. Okay, so this is this boundary algebra here for Tor code has this nice description in terms of Z mod two graded Hilbert spaces. Now there's also something a little weird in Tor code where Hilb Z mod two and Rep Z mod two are kind of the same thing. It's also here isomorphic to Rep, the end of Rep Z mod two, where I take functions on Z mod two, and I take that to the end because of Z mod two. So you have to be a little bit careful um, because Torah code, you might think it's like let and when for Z mod two, or you might think it's like let and when for rep Z mod two, but it's it's actually neither. It's actually kind of both at the same time. So that's an important thing to, to mention. So neither of these is canonical in a sense, right? Like the, these isomorphisms. Um, they're not canonical, but they're almost they're canonical-ish. I mean, like you're working with computational basis here. Yeah. So if I pick the computational basis and I think about like picking, you know, zero and one, I get one of them. And then if I think about the the SA X and I think about plus minus, I get the other one. So it's it's not canonical, but it's really I haven't made too many. The choices aren't too bad to get the isomorphism. It's it's canonical enough. <laughs> yeah. You no. Know? Um so here are some other examples, another example. And this one is a, a number of authors. Uh, there's like seven authors and I, this is uh, from, it's, it's a recent paper. The main ones were, uh, the undergraduate researchers were Tomba and uh, Wei, where we're undergrads for my research group. And then there's a whole uh, mentoring team, but there they did Kataya Quantum Double And for the Kataev quantum double model, um, you basically get this, it's basically the same setup as Torah code. And there you have to be a little bit careful about which, which boundary you're taking. So if you take um, the smooth type boundary, so here where the boundary algebra looks like that, the boundary algebra in this case, it's end in rep G of C to the G to the tensor N. And then your boundary could also look like, it could be split around that way. It could look rough in that case. And so you do the kind of same kind of thing, but here your boundary operators look like X, X, X. And well, in Torah code, they would look like this, but then really we're in Katai quantum double. So it's, they look a little different. But in this case, the boundary algebra is N of pill G of the group algebra for the tensor N. 
So, you know, when we started this project, I always, I always used to think a type of quantum double was a model that looked like held G. But then, you know, there's also things in the physics literature that, oh, it's really a model for rep G and those, you know, finite depth quantum circuits that map between these things. Really, it's a model for both. It, it's a model for the quantum double. It's in the title, quantum double. It's a model for the quantum double. And um, by taking different cuts, different fusion category nets appear. Um, the other thing that we do in our paper, theorem, which is uh, Corey Jones, uh, Nikens, myself, and Wallach, for 11 when, and for our, this is for our 11 when, um, we have a certain model which is different than the usual 11 when model. Uh, but for ours, it, it, what we do is we pick this generator, this strong tensor generator, as Corey was saying, of all the simples, you take their direct sum x, and then in this case, the boundary algebra, you can prove it to be endomorphisms of x to the tensor n, where there are n plus one sites along the boundary. So, so or n these, sites along the boundary. These yeah. examples, you're thinking of uh, qdits at the at the edges, right? But now here, are you putting qdits at the vertices again? For these are yeah. So for our eleven when our our model is. Um, I guess I could I can say a quick minute about what uh what R eleven when looks like. It would seem like anytime you're putting qubits on the edges, you can have this smooth versus rough. That's right. Our ours are only on the vertices for for that. That's right. Um. Yeah. So we we put all the weight on the vertices. It's a lot like uh, Kong. Kong has this like. 2012 kind of very short article where he kind of talks about these things and and states some results but so we you know it was kind of hard to find proof so we provided some proofs for what he was saying uh for 11 when paper with Kataya? uh no it's not one with Kataya. it's a different one in 2012 so for 11 when what we do is you're thinking of weights that go on vertices and the idea is that you you're, you're always thinking about orienting things, right? And so what we do is, one way to do it is to put A and B here and then say C and D here and take a big direct sum over all of them. So you're looking at, what does this mean? It's the big direct sum over A, B, C, and D of HOM in the category from A, B to C, D. So I'm always reading that way. So you could do this. And then if you're thinking about what our X is, this is exactly end of, X tensor two, that's the local Hilbert space. And then you have your edge terms make the simple edge labels match and your Poquette terms glue in the regular element. And so it's, that's 11 one. So if you do this version, then essentially what you get is um, you've got some, some chunk here or whatever, some Lambda. In this case, uh, you only need to go one. In this case, S is one. It's actually quite easy. Um, and your lambdas can be degenerately thin. Everything, everything is really nice here. Effectively, what the boundary algebra is, it glues on. You, you basically glue on things from this categorical net onto the right. And those are the operators that commute with everything else. So really, if you're thinking of N and C of X to the tensor N, these look like every, every label here has an X and there's N of them. And you're just taking it and gluing it on there. And if you can think about this ground state space for 11 when in terms of skein modules for the category, that's how that all works. But we we explained that all in the paper. That's a little harder as an example that for everybody. So that's why I didn't choose that one. Okay. So as Corey was talking about with localized excitations, so Um, right, so if you look at all of these nets of boundary algebras that we're getting, they're all fusion categorical nets. All our boundary nets are, I guess, uh, we call them fusion spin chains. So I'll use that. And then, so Corey has this theorem That says, um, if I take this so-called DHR category, 
of this fusion spin chain associated to my fusion category. It's a braided fusion. It's a it's a, a braided fusion category, and it's equivalent to Z of C. So this allows us to recover the bulk excitations. from the so-called local rep, ro local rep theory of the boundary. So this, I, I think Corey made this point quite well in his talk and unless there are more questions about it, I won't go too much into that. But that's the idea. If you think about where the errors are accumulating on the boundary, that's how you're, you think of these strings, these in, in Xiao Gong's language, You've got your excitations that, that are forced into the boundary and your strings go back into the bulk. And then, so if you think about that local representation theory of where those errors are accumulating, that's where you're gonna see your, your category of excitations. But then then all, you can realize all possible, all possible boundaries. In your, I mean, because as you know, there are several possible C that have the same infield center. So confused about that. Right. So the point is, this is a thing that takes in a lattice model mm -hmm. and gives you this boundary algebra, which is a way to study the excitations. But your lattice model might not actually know which fusion category it's representing. Exactly. Because lattice models aren't about fusion categories. Mm -hmm. They're about excitations. Yeah. So Kataev quantum double model is a very good example of this. Right. You don't know. It's not a Hill G model. It's not a Rep G model. It's both. And it depends on how you slice the lattice. Yeah. You know how to get like other boundaries for like you know for a group G there would be a subgroup and a group plus cycle. Yes. You know how to cut it to get yes. that specific model. Yes. So this is our state based approach to to get boundaries, which that's the next topic. That was like goal number four. This was goal number three. I think I have what ten minutes left. Is that right? Yeah. You're saying you get all the boundary conditions by just cutting the lattice geometrically. By cutting the lattice geometrically and thinking about states on the boundary mm -hmm. algebra. So you have to think about states now on this boundary algebra. So let me talk about states. So before I said that I had this net of projections and I didn't need some kind of Hamiltonian or or any kind of state in the picture, that's kind of, I'm, I'm basically lying through my teeth when I say that, because if you start with this net of projections, it gives you a canonical state on this quasi-local algebra. So remember, if we take the limit, uh, Corey called it, it's a co-limit here, of my A of lambda, and then we can call this A, which is what Corey called the quasi-local algebra. Okay, so I'm doing it in this category of C star algebras. Um, here, there's a canonical state. from a net of projections. And what is it? Well, if you think locally, X and A of lambda, if I take P delta X, P delta, it's some scalar, psi of X times P delta, if lambda is completely surrounded by delta. I get some scalar there, and the scalar might depend on delta a priori, but it doesn't, so theorem, psi delta of x does not depend on the, basically it doesn't depend on delta at all. And so it gives me this positive linear functional, positive and psi of one is one. And that's enough to know that it's a, it's a state. And actually it's, it's actually exceptionally nice if I take psi of any P lambda is one for every lambda, okay? And so this says actually, if your P, P, if your projections are these local projections for the local ground state spaces coming from a commuting projector for efficient free Hamiltonian, it turns out in that case, um, so let's write that down. When this net P lambda comes from some Hamiltonian, which is nice, so commuting projector registration free. Psi is the unique translation variant ground state. In the sense of Bradley Robinson, who studied, you know, this this thing for this operator algebraic version of these. Now this theorem is true under what conditions? 
that psi delta is indeed one on delta. This is any under our LTO conditions. Just under LTO conditions, under the LTO axioms. That's it. Really under LTO one. As soon as you have LTO one, that's set, that's satisfied. So that's nice. Um, great. So now, how do we study state? How do we have the state of pace of based approach to boundaries? Well, how do we go about doing that? What you do is you take your lattice, and at some point you just decide to cut it somewhere. Okay. So I'm going to cut with some sub lattice here. So whatever I pick this. And then on this side, I can take again a limit, which I'm going to call a h. H stands for half plane. So I have this half plane algebra here. All right. And on this boundary, I can form the boundary net B. Okay. And now it turns out if I think instead of this completely surrounded business, if I take lambda and it just surrounds now on, on three sides, remember this looks like something like this. Yeah. Here, if I take p delta x p delta, where this guy is in a of lambda, this is something that you would call maybe e delta of x p delta. And again, you might think it depends on delta, but it doesn't. So what this gives you is a quantum channel. B, which goes from the half plane algebra to the boundary algebra. Um, so now this this quantum channel is especially nice because I can actually also cut down by large deltas. What if my operators in in what if lambda, that rectangle, is actually far enough away from the boundary? Because those are, you can have operators that don't meet the boundary at all, right? They're not supported on sites near the boundary. Well, what happens in that case? If I cut down by P delta and they're far enough away, it's just a scalar, right? You just observe. If X is some operator in this half plane algebra is supported away from the boundary. From the boundary, then p delta x p delta again is just psi of x times p delta, right? So what this means is that e is equal to psi away from the boundary. Yeah. What does that mean? It means that if phi is any state on B, then if I extend it to the half plane algebra, it has to be equal to psi away from the boundary. Yeah, because it's just a scalar already and states map one to one. Okay, so this essentially means that we can talk about states on this boundary algebra and there we have a state-based approach to boundaries now, okay? So what we can do is say, uh, yeah, now at this point, I was gonna talk about quite Quite technical thing here about how to talk when you know that a state is topological. Should have talked to Corey a little bit beforehand. I just didn't think I was going to get up here with the. <laughs> I thought the questions were going to completely stop me from getting to this point. I guess I only have about three minutes left, so I can either say something which is maybe only a couple people in the room might have a chance to understand, or just say um, we have a definition. Of what it means for a boundary state phi on B to be topological. Okay. And these boundaries that you were talking about, like when I have a subgroup and a you know two co-cycle or whatever, 
these correspond to algebra objects in your category, and you're here there. So there are states on fusion categorical nets for all of these things that you're talking about. So if you name a, a if you name a gapped boundary from your system to the vacuum, I claim we have a corresponding topological boundary state. And we can do that in our language. For any state, any any gap boundary state you want to talk about, we get a we get a topological boundary state, and it, and it works for our definition. And so we actually prove this for uh, the example we actually prove in our paper is we take uh, Levinwin, and we take uh, the we take C. C is a our gapped boundary from right Z of C of bulk, and I have C here corresponds to a canonical Lagrangian algebra. And we get a, uh, this corresponds to the state, a state on the boundary algebra B, remember B of I here was N and C of X to the tensor N, where um, the number of sites of I is N. What does the state look like? Um, I of F is, well, I take F and I'm gonna put a bunch of things here like this, where this map is the map from one to X. So one is down here, it doesn't get a string. X is up here, this is an isometry. So the idea is that X was this big direct sum of simples. So in particular, one is a subobject of X. There's some isometry that you go in there <coughs> with. And then this, so if I call this thing V, this would be the dagger. So it doesn't matter which isometry you picked because it's unique up to phase. And that phase, the, that, the bar of the phase appears up here. So just do this. And that's uh, something from one to one. So that's a scalar. That's a state, it's a topological boundary state. It recovers this gapped boundary to vacuum. Okay. So that's that's our, our way that we can use our language to talk about a, this state-based approach to, to gap boundaries or top, we call them topological boundaries. But we fully expect that yeah, these are these are exactly the gap boundaries that the physicists talk about in their system. I think that's I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah. B I that's what we need. Or... So B is uh good point. Thank you. Uh just like you can take this uh limit for a you take a uh, limit of the i's to get b so b is this the the boundary net here well, i have something for every interval but again if intervals are included i get inclusions this is exactly like Corey's net of it's another net of algebras and so you can again take the quasi local algebra the physical question, physical question of like you know I know the states are like functionals on the boundary of it. Like, can you imagine like you know, normally in the other picture, if if you put the state first and then boundary, is it supported on just the boundary, or do you think it's so? Because our boundary operator, our boundary algebra is supported kind of near the the boundary. You have to extend, but so I mean it. it the question's a little bit uh not not kind of posed well because yeah. like if you have a boundary state, um it's supported on just that algebra and it doesn't I mean I guess you can you can extend it to the whole algebra in this way. But then it's not so it's supported lots of places, right? It's it is the canonical ground state away from the boundary. So there's plenty of things that have you know non-zero value there. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I think you could do something. So if I just if I think about the eleven one model, right? So I kind of think about these boundary states. So I'm thinking about the gapped boundaries. So we know that these are modules for the underlying fusion category, right? Yes. So if I can rearrange these boundary algebras into some bi category, right? There should be some. There should be some two category of modules of the fusion category C. If this was eleven and one, but in your construction you didn't input a fusion category C. And so if you form this two category of kind of of these boundary algebras, you basically said something like, even though I started off with a net of projections, I could interpret this as some model based on a fusion category. Sure. So uh, let me let me 
is it okay if I start talking about three categories? Is that, you think you're all right with that? Okay. So the point is there should be a three category of, of fusion spin chains should actually be objects in a three category right, yeah. because fusion categories are objects in three categories. I'll just say that. Yeah. So there should be a three functor from the three category of fusion cat. So from three vec say yeah. to, to the three category of, of spin chains yeah. of, of whatever. And so um, you should expect to see all of that fully represented there in a functorial kind of way. Yeah. Okay. That, that's what I expect. Um, but yeah. You assume translation variance somewhere, or is it in your axiom? I did assume translation variance, uh, and I didn't say it. It's in my notes. The point is that I want my project, my net of projections, to be translation variant. So that would be the condition that p of uh, say lambda plus z, so z is translation. That's add translation by z of p. Lambda. Yeah, definitely want a translation variant. Yes. It's not a complaint, but I didn't see much topology in this talk. <laughs> um, what about what happens when you put the Boeing code on the torus? But what happened if you? That's a great question. Has some non-trivial topology. Uh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Because this is about for coming up with the bulk topological order in such a way that you know we only ever had to deal with contractible patches to do this story. Um. Yeah, th this story doesn't have to talk about. Yeah, yes, you can put it on there. That's more of the TQFT side, right? So our story is about, you know, you've got your topological order and you want to recover from that some category. But I agree that there's a place for topology, but it's the arrow going that way. And, you know, that's another way that you could go about trying to get the modular category. First, get the TQFT and then use the TQFT to do that. But somehow, like, um, this is saying you don't even have to do or topology to get the category back. You can just do it from contractible patches. It's somehow a feature. Yeah, and, and in some in some sense also, you don't need to have this very, very big. I mean, I suppose that the whole information is, is done in a sufficiently large finite uh, lattice uh, for fusion category. Uh, you have to be careful. Um, because again, if you want to really get fusion at the end of the day, yes. and you have these algebras and you're trying to look at bimodules for the algebras, well, the unit for bimodules for the algebra is the algebra itself as a bimodule, and you want that to be simple. So if you stop at any finite level, you have a direct sum of multi-matrix algebras, which is going to have center. This was Corey's point, right? You had to go to the, to yes, the quasi-local algebra to get the... Well, yeah. yeah. So it's it's... Almost, okay. almost. I, I would love to say yes, but unfortunately there's this tricky little part of it. Yeah. 